So open source security has been in the news quite a bit because uh, it hasn't always been so good. So, you know, Poodle, Heartbleed, Shellshock, Ghost. My, my boss has this ever-growing title where he tries to fit all of these things into one, one sentence. It's, it's terrible. Uh, you can see him at OSCON in a few, a few weeks. Um, with all these high-profile bugs, some of it is that, that security is hard, and some of it is that bug marketing has gotten a lot better. But one of the great things about this is that a lot of people are actually actively interested in improving their security, but maybe don't know how. So this is a talk for people who are at that stage. I'm not going to cover so much how to convince other people that security is important. So if you want to talk about that, we can talk afterwards. And uh, I, I, I'm, I'm going to start with a warranty disclaimer. Uh, you might think this is not a thing that I would need to do, and you, it would be perfectly obvious that no one's ever going to solve all security, but I actually had a meeting with a project manager last week where he was terribly disappointed when I pointed out to him that even if he followed all the rules, I could not guarantee that his product was never going to have a security bug again. So, you know, I, I appreciate his optimism. I think it's really great that there are people in the world who feel this is possible. I'm not really one of them. So this is a talk mostly about getting people interested and a few things you could do to, to get started because we have a lot of talks about how to get started open source. I thought maybe we should have one about getting started in security. So as you heard from my fine intro, I, am a, I have a PhD in web security. I really do say that it's a PhD in horribleness. You know how you get a degree in web security? You do a project on like looking up security information about different technologies and you get the, the short straw and you get the web and you read a bunch of it and then you give a presentation saying this is horrible and your, your uh, favorite prof goes, hmm, sounds like thesis research. And sort of that was that. There's a much longer story involving a broken back and a broken skylight that you can t hear at some other time over coffee if you want. But uh, the reason I'm more or less qualified to give this talk is that I work over at Intel Jones Farm. I'm part of the security team there. We have quite a large security team over there and then even more around the world. Uh, obviously, I do not speak for Intel, but uh, some of this talk will include things I've learned from, from there and from my other open source proje projects before that. And uh, I, I just want to brag because I am getting a new house key. My new house should, should be turned over to me in 13 minutes. Um, obviously, I'm not there. But uh, hopefully, I'm going to be staying in Portland for a while because uh, certainly, I've got the debt to prove it. <laughs> so I've divided this up into whoops, three, uh, five sort of ranges of, of things to think about. So the first thing is about encouraging existing security researchers to be interested in your project and interested in work with you, or perhaps more to the point, not actively discouraging people from working with you. So number one, and this is like actually on the checklist of things we do sometimes to see whether we want to work with a, with a project, is a, have a way to report security bugs. And this is important because not everyone wants security bugs to be public. So you don't necessarily want to dump it into the public mailing list or the bug tracker. It, maybe it doesn't upset you. Maybe it doesn't upset the bug reporter. But someone is going to be really upset. So you want to make it obvious how to do this, how to do this well, so that that's clear. And it is kind of used as a sign to say, does this project care enough about security to at least think this far? So there you go. You can go and put your, your security at email address on your website. You've done step one. You're, you're ready to go. <coughs> the, the, uh, the next thing is that when people report bugs, send them a thank you. Do not send them a cease and desist. <coughs> Again, I would like to believe that this is not a thing that we need to say, but people are very uncomfortable with the idea of security research, and it's, it's, it can be very problematic. In fact, it can be entirely illegal. While I was at uh, Carleton University in Ottawa, we were going through, I don't even remember the bill number, but there was a, there was a new bill that said that doing any sort of uh, decompiling, they, they used a different word though, 
it, if you looked at the source code of a web page, you were breaking their DMCA style laws unless you were a security researcher. Yeah, we, we wrote a lot of letters. The, the bill died on the table for unrelated reasons. I'm sure they're trying to bring it back. So don't, don't go right to the legal point. These people are already sticking their necks out for you. The other thing that should be obvious, because of course you're all excellent at responding to all bug requests you get from anyone, <laughs> is, is that you should actually give people some sort of feedback. It's especially important for security bugs though, one, because you have probably whisked them off to a private location and, and there's no way for the responder to know that it even submitted correctly. And two, because while if you have a bug for a regular person, they're going to be sad if you don't fix it. They're going to be angry. They may stop using their product. If you have a bug that's a security bug, it is possible they will tell the entire world how to attack your software and your customers. Yeah, so um, you want to discourage that. Sharing a little bit of information can go a long way. And on the same note, you don't want to immediately say that's not a security issue. It doesn't matter if it's true. It often is. Pe people don't always understand. It often isn't. But it's like waving a flag in front of a bull. You are saying, I am so secure, bring it. Yeah, you don't want to do that. <laughs> it doesn't matter if you're right. Just, it's, it's not an encouraging thing to hear. Yeah, so that's the thing is, I don't understand how that's a security thing. Can you show me is a much better way to respond. And sometimes they won't be able to help you, and sometimes they will. Not everything is a security issue. You just have to take it at least a little bit seriously. Maybe you'll be able to convince them it isn't a security issue either. So something you probably noticed about these first few things is that they are all things you probably want to be doing anyways. You may not have the resources to do them, but security bugs are just bugs. We know how to deal with bugs. We know how to work with bugs. We know how to communicate with people who report bugs. It's not really a different best practice at this point. It's just you might want to take it a little bit faster than you otherwise would because people get concerned very quickly. One thing that is a little bit less common for regular bugs is the practice of bug bounties, which some companies believe in, some companies don't. I'm, I, I don't believe we do it at Intel, but I know lots of other uh, companies that work in open source do. And that's offering up money for interesting security bugs. But unless you are working for a company that backs a lot of open source work or even a lot of open source security work, money may not be an option. It is surprising how little you need to, to be encouraging and motivational. Uh, one thing that's really big is having a brag wall on your website. So uh, as I said, I'm Canadian. I'm, I've been recently going through the green card process, and one of the things they asked me was to have like public proof of everything that I might have done in security, and also any news articles that had been written about me, even if they were about feminism and not security, and anything that made me famous ever. <laughs> so. You may think that's not really a big deal, nobody's ever gonna look at it, but depending on people's circumstances, that's the difference between you know, getting a job offer and not, because look, there, here's proof that they can do what they say they can do, or it could be the difference between getting a green card and not, because look, here's proof of what they say they can do. So, and then on the, on the other hand, on top of doing that, project stickers are surprisingly motivational. When, <laughs> when I was, you know, a, a teenage proto software developer and I had to send in my copyright assignment to the Free Software Foundation in like 1998. They sent me back a little sticker and a signed thank you from Stallman and because I didn't know him at the time, I thought that was really amazing and I was actually really motivated. I did a lot of work that I might not have otherwise immediately jumped into because I felt like the Free Software Foundation really valued me. So, you know, Sometimes it's just a sticker or a, like a postcard or whatever. Could make a difference. Although getting security people to give you their addresses may be challenging. <laughs> so I wanted to tell you a story about uh, my, my fa favorite story of someone, someone uh, reacting to a security bug. 
And this was uh, one of the Apache projects. I'm not sure which one, probably Cordova, because most of my work is in web security. And uh, I had had to contact the researcher for some reason, who, a researcher who had found a bug and hadn't visibly gotten a response from the community. And I, I needed to follow up and say, hey, what's the status of this? Is there anything I can do to help? And the email I got back was totally heartening. The email I got back said, oh, yeah, it took a little while, but they got in touch with me. And we've been talking back and forth about how we're going to solve things. And also, they invited me to join their security committee to review future patches. And I'm like, this guy was super happy about it. I think he may have been a grad student. So you know, this is like super resume fodder for, for, for a grad student. Sitting on any sort of committee makes you look awesome. I don't really know why, because they're not that interesting now that I sit on them. But you know, whatever. It, he was really excited, and he was really happy. And he really felt like Apache had valued his feedback and uh, his, his work. So definitely, a little bit of encouragement goes a long way. And obviously, Apache was pretty much winning because now they have a security researcher who is willing to review more stuff. You know, it seems ridiculous to say that this is a great example where you, you reward the guy who did work with more work. But if everyone's happy, everyone's happy. So maybe you haven't had very much luck attracting people who do security work to your project. And you've decided, OK, well, maybe that's going to happen eventually, but I can't wait. So, I want to encourage people in my community to learn more. So where do people usually start? So usually when people are like, I'm going to learn about security, they like stick some terms into Google, and they find 30,000 hits of contradictory information, and it's really confusing. And they give up, and then the next time I give a talk, they're like, I don't understand how you do any of this. So that is totally fair. It's totally confusing and awful. That's how I got a PhD, was saying, it's totally confusing and awful. Let's do it. So you know, the, it's, it's not a thing that most people do. But uh, you don't have to start there. So one thing that uh, I've started doing just to pick up new skills, the, the problem with having a PhD is you sort of narrow focus on one thing, and it's not necessarily the thing that your company wants to pay you for. So uh, I'm really good at one specific type of security policy for web apps. And uh, this is not always relevant to what I need to do at work. So I d we do a lot of courses. And one of the things I found is that taking online courses is like going to the gym. If I don't have a buddy or a class, it's never going to happen and I'm never going to finish. So set up a study group. That's also really important for online courses because they aren't always of the same quality. And so having someone to talk to to say, hey, the prof just gave this entire lecture about simple query language. Does he not know what the word simple is? I'm pretty sure it's structured query language, right? This is, it happened in a course that I took. So you know, having, having people to feedback, having people to encourage you, having people to play off of goes a long way. And setting up a study group on your mailing list or whatever can, can be really helpful. And you may think, well, who's going to want to do this? But I know that uh, when I started at Intel, we were hiring pretty intensely. And uh, my boss came up to us one day and said, OK, I think we have hired anyone who knows both open source and security who is on the job market right now. So Find your security friends who don't mind learning open source, and find your, your open source friends who don't mind learning security, and we'll talk. So it's an in-demand skill. Some of your contributors probably want jobs, might just want to know more about it. And even if you don't want to go into security specifically, being able to say you have some experience working with security bugs is not a bad thing for any programmer or any designer or any documenter. It's, it's not necessarily just a programming thing. But courses are kind of archaic. Like, I, I spent hours watching really boring lectures and thought, didn't I just get three degrees and promise myself I was never going to do this again? So if you're in that sort of situation, <laughs> you do not have to do that. Uh, there's a whole bunch of interesting tutorials and stuff that you can do the same thing. Get, get a group together, try them out. Uh, the two at the top here, I actually really like. Uh, Overthewire.org has this war games that starts you off with just like 
logging into, to SSHing into a server, and then finding the password for the next level, and SSHing into the next level, and finding the password for that, and it gets increasingly difficult. It's actually strangely compelling. I haven't gotten very far. Uh, DC Darknet is uh, the DEF CON Darknet one. You may think of DEF CON as being a much, bunch of miscreants, and you're probably right. But uh, DC Darknet is, was intended as a uh, starter point for, for people who couldn't, couldn't really participate in the like hardcore contest where you get a group of 24 people together and you sit in a room for, for the entire conference trying to crack these codes. DC Darknet was meant to be something that you could do a little bit more casually. So it's super fun. I have like the little device for, for pairing with people and stuff that they were using to demo with the stuff. So, so yeah, there's, there's definitely ways to, to play with things that are not online courses. And then the next step of playing with things is to get a whole group of people together and play with things. So one of my coworkers likes to say that open source people are doing hackathons wrong. Because, you know, OK, sure, you go to a hackathon, you build a little feature. We all know that it's fun to build the towers. <laughs> but it's a lot more fun to knock them down. So how do you run a security hackathon? What makes it different? So obviously, there is the big difference that instead of necessarily building things, you're breaking things. But what else? Are you going to have to do differently if you want to run a good security hackathon? So first, there's a whole list of things that are totally familiar. You still want to bring food. You still want to make sure people can get home safely after the, the uh, thing. You still need enough time. I think there were probably even other course, uh, talks here on how to give a good hackathon. So I'll refer you to the archives of, of uh, OS Bridge for, for more advice on that front. One of the first things that's really important to do if you want to run a security-based hackathon is to set some ground rules. And this is because a lot of security tools are not very friendly to other people. So if you are, say, at OS Bridge running your little security hackathon in the downstairs corner, you do not want to accidentally blow out the Wi-Fi or saturate the entire network or start attacking random other people's computers. You know, like having a set of IP addresses that are appropriate to direct your terrible tools at is really important. Sometimes when we're doing these things internally, we have to very carefully follow network rules to make sure that uh, untrusted code doesn't end up on our trusted networks and stuff. So take a look at what you need to do. Make sure you have some ground rules and that they're pretty clear. Things like architecture diagrams can really help here. And I know it's hard to actually prep a hackathon even at a normal pace, let alone having to do all these extra steps, but it's totally worth it. People love breaking things. And things will break repeatedly. The other thing that is really important is to have some fast resets for the systems that you're working on once things are broken enough. You don't want to sort of do it in an automated way usually because you don't want to interrupt someone who's halfway through working on something. But having lots of copies, virtual machines are awesome. Having some sort of backup infrastructure for things that our people are working on. And having support on hand. Um, I did a, a hackathon uh, on cloud, sec cloud security using OpenStack. And I don't know how many of you have tried to set up OpenStack, but it takes a while. It's not something you want to do repeatedly in the middle of a hackathon. So we were really glad that we had someone who had set up some, some images that we could just jump back to whenever we needed to, to reset the uh, infrastructure we're working on. We broke a lot of things. Some of them were just our infrastructure because we weren't so good with the ground rules. But we learned a lot. It was pretty cool. Another thing that uh, can be pretty important is having a tracker for your issues. Again, security issues, you may not want to dump them all in your regular bug tracker. Also, sometimes you're on a separate network from everything else because you don't want to put live dangerous things on the internet or on your corporate network or your you know, library network. So in that case, having things like ether pads so people can share data or an internal IRC server actually makes a huge difference because there's a lot of times where people want to cut and paste, look, I found the password for this, and it's you know 14 <coughs> characters long. And so being able to share data in a useful way, again, 
telling people not to break that infrastructure, always important. And just like any other hackathon, you don't need everyone to be an expert. Obviously, if you get a group of expert security hackers in a room, you're going to get a little bit further than you will with a, with a mixed group. But that's not really the point at this stage. What we're trying to do is get people a little bit more exposure to, to the issues so they understand them, get people to learn a little bit, and maybe motivate a few to, to, to become expert level. So a few things that are really kind of fun for beginners is brainstorming on threats, which I'll talk a little bit, a little bit more in a second. Uh, one thing you can do is run, run some security tools in advance and have people triage bugs. So a lot of people who come out to hackathons are developers. They're familiar with triaging bugs. They'll be able to, to do that sort of thing. And so if they get super frustrated with whatever they're working on, you can always have them do something more familiar. Pair breaking, which is basically pair programming only more malicious. And you can always run the tutorials and, and games when, when, when people need a break. So uh, threat modeling. For those of you not familiar with threat modeling, threat modeling is basically user stories about users who hate you and want to, to destroy everything you've worked for. So it's, it's a skill, but it's not something that a, that a new person can't just sort of brainstorm about. Everyone has had an angry person in their life or has had to worry about something like doxing and has had to think about this sort of thing. So even though maybe it's not going to spring to mind immediately, there's a lot of issues that uh, novices will come up with that maybe experts won't, so it's really beneficial. And another thing that, uh, that I thought was really great at this cloud hackathon I just went to was that they gave out prizes for being helpful, which when you're bringing in a bunch of mentors who maybe would otherwise get fixated on whatever they were working on themselves, just a little extra incentive to, to say, you know, the important part here for this particular hackathon is more about security learning than about actually breaking everything. There's plenty of time for breaking everything. We can do that in you know, round five. But we, th we found that was actually really, really fun because it, uh, it encouraged people to do a lot more interaction than they might otherwise. The other things to celebrate are, are uh, so I spent uh, quite a number of years teaching uh, first year computer science students. And what I learned about teaching first year university is that students have been told their whole lives that failure is bad and that they will never get a job if they fail and that they will never get into the college that they want. And so they are super uncomfortable with the idea of, idea of failing being a really good thing. So again, one thing that we used to do in my tutorials was really celebrate. You have 10,000 syntax errors. Let's see if we can get 10,007. <laughs> you know, and especially with the students I was working with, people really respond to it. Once you get into the spirit of it, it's really easy to be excited about breaking things. And it's much easier to break things than it is to fix things. So you can really get people enjoying themselves and having a good time and feeling like they've accomplished something because breaking is accomplishing in this case. So uh, think a little bit about things or do it on the fly based on what you see that people are actually doing as you're going around as an organizer. So one thing that comes up is that people often think, well, security people spend years training to do this, lots of time practicing, and sometimes exploits take months to find and refine. What are we really going to do in a day-long hackathon? And so I'd like to tell you all a little story about when I was working at Carleton, and I think I had just started my PhD, and I had a, an, a, another student come up to me and say, hey, Terry, I've always wondered, how long does it take to like, learn to break a website? And I'm like, I don't know, but we got a new assignment submission system today. Let's find out. <laughs> this is a thing you can really only do if you're a security researcher at the university. They don't really like it when random students do that, but we, we had a little bit of, uh, of you know, security cred, so we could tend to get away with it as long as we weren't too disruptive. So the answer was about a half hour. And then the next question was, how do we report security bugs to the administration in a way that they will pay attention to? So uh, which turned out to be much longer than a half hour. <laughs> so you can definitely find things. There is often very low hanging fruit. And there's definitely 
often interesting things to find very early on. Hopefully that's not going to be true in all of your projects, but even finding weird things that ways break is kind of fun. So I mentioned suggesting that you try running a few tools. And if you're new to security, it's the same problem as looking for security resources. There's 30 bazillion of them. Some of them are awesome. Some of them are super sucky. Some of them just aren't the right tool for the right job. So I'm going to make a few suggestions about ones that I've seen people use at hackathons and uh, for, for doing exploits that they had a pretty good time with. But don't feel that these are the be all and end all or that they're even necessarily the best ones for you. So for a hackathon toolkit, it's often nice to just have a quick little USB stick that you give to every participant. They stick it in their machine. They boot it up. They don't have to worry about accidentally destroying their own data. I know, USB sticks. But <laughs> you, you can pay some attention to the controllers. Um, or you can give people really crappy laptops, which is what we do at work sometimes. <laughs> But you can give something, people something to boot in a VM on a stick that has a bunch of tools. The one that we've been using lately is Kali. It has way more tools than you're ever going to use, but it does have a little bit of description of each. And it has a lot of the most popular ones that you'll be able to find tutorials for online. So it's not a bad place to start. Another great place to start for beginners is fuzzing. For those of you not familiar with fuzzing, this is where you take your program and you stuff crap in every orifice or interface that you can find. It's not good for your program. It will not be happy. But you find a lot of things that a lot of them aren't security errors. They're just going to be random crashes that, for data that you haven't thought about. Some of them will be security errors. But the fun thing about it is that if you've never done it before, usually you can find something really fast. So it's very satisfying for people to try out a couple of new ones find a couple of bugs, report them, feel like they've really accomplished something as a starter task. So it's, it's, a good, it's a good place to start if you haven't done it before. If you've done it before, it's not going to be quite as useful. It, terrifying. terrifying is also a word. So, so the one that everyone I know is excited about lately is, is called American Fuzzy Lop after the rabbit because, you know, it's a fuzz tester. It does make it hard to search for it. You have to look for American Fuzzy Lop vulnerability testing if you want the right one sometimes, depending on which search engine you use. Another super popular series of tools are static code analysis tools. There's lots of them. Uh, one of my coworkers likes to claim that they're all terrible, but still super useful. So your mileage may vary. Uh, a couple that, uh, that have come up recently is Coverity, which is not free software, but is free for open source projects. It has a huge number of heuristics. You find some very interesting things. It's what they use on the Linux kernel, among other projects. Uh, SonarCube is one that is open source that uh, we're, we're, we're kind of hoping that it's going to be amazing and awesome and we'll be able to, to use it a lot in the future. But if you're not ready to be overwhelmed with 30 bazillion bugs, sometimes using one that's not quite as mature is a, is a good place for beginners to start. And things like Clang and LLVM, Static Analyzer. Someone pointed out to me that even PyLint has a few security-related rules in it. So if you're running that, you're already running a security tool, and you're totally awesome. What, another thing that people really enjoy doing is actually breaking into things. So the, the, the venerable uh, uh, pen testing tool is, is probably Metasploit. But uh, for those of you who are working in the web application space, Things like Web Scarab and Burp will do something similar. So often what it does is it sets up a fuzz tester, it waits until something breaks, and then it shoves every exploit it can find in that tube to see if it can do something interesting. So this is actually really fun to run on a web app while, while you've got uh, beginners around because you can just watch it like generating 30,000 really hilarious usernames and doing all sorts of stuff that it shouldn't be doing. So even if it's not being super successful, it's still kind of fun to watch. So I, I really enjoy working in the web space, in part because the bugs are very easy to find. And so they're, 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 uh, they're, it's really great for teaching. You can, you can explain things. And in part, just because it is hilarious. So. Another tool that maybe is not so interesting for beginners but might be sort of a well-rounded thing in your arsenal is having a CVE checker. So the 
this is a series of numbered vulnerabilities in, in various products. Uh, there's a great common vulnerability. Oh, goodness. Exposure? Might be commercial. I'm afraid I would have to Google it. It's one of those things. Yeah, it, well, it's, it's a vulnerability. So there is an open source security mailing list that if you want to follow it, it's kind of like drinking from the fire hose, but you can set up filters. Uh, I'll give a little plug to some of my coworkers who've been working on this CVE check tool where you give it a list of packages and libraries that you care about, and it spits out what's, uh, and, and versions, and it spits out any uh, CVEs that are currently applied to those. So that's kind of a nice little tool to be able to integrate and something we use at work. And so that brings me to my last uh, section, which is just a teensy tiny little bit on security best practices. This is a huge field of study. There are people who get their entire PhDs in this and they all disagree with each other. But here's a couple of things that, that you might want to consider setting up as you're trying to follow up after you've done a hackathon or after you've done a tutorial and you want to feel a little bit more confident about your products. So, one thing that I absolutely love is checklists. I'm totally terrible at using them in my personal life. I'm totally terrible at using them even to remember to, to do other things. But you don't forget things nearly as often when they're on the checklist. So if you want to hear a whole lot about the theory of checklists, I highly recommend this book. It's actually totally awesome, talking about checklists. I, the one I found most compelling was all the, the, the talk of checklists in healthcare and how to reduce infection by remembering to wash your hands and talk to the patient beforehand and make sure that they're doing the surgery that you think they're doing and that sort of thing. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's actually quite, quite an interesting book. It also applies to security. Everyone's checklists are going to be a little bit different. So seeing what other people have done may or may not be useful to you. But even starting with a small one, like before we do a release, we run the CVE checker and see what's in there. Before we do a release, we make sure that we have enough people respond, who, who are ready to respond to security at my project. And you can make yourself a little checklist that'll be just a little bit more prepared for the next time. Oh, I should say, my, my favorite thing on our internal checklist, there's lots of things on our internal checklist that I probably shouldn't talk about, but I think this one's pretty public. The, the internal checklist we have has a, has a line that says, don't include back doors. And I have to check that off before a product goes out the door. So that's kind of cool. I, I am reassured that I'm supposed to check for it. How you make sure that you know, 20,000 lines of code or hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines of code don't have any back doors is another question entirely. But at least we have to think about it. So it's kind of cool. And then, of course, even Better than checklist is automation. So making it so that when you run your release scripts, it does the checker and, and sends you errors. Figuring out ways to build in security tests. So when you're doing all your fuzzing and you're finding horrible things, make some of the relevant ones that you're worried about into test cases. This is all stuff that's really good for, for beginners to do once you've found a little bit of information. Same as, same as it is for, for any other thing. Tests are not necessarily easy to write, but give you a different understanding of the system if, if you're wanting to do more work in there. So what's sort of my call to action here? First, security bugs are just bugs. Open source people have handled bugs for years and years. You can do this. It's, it's, it's not beyond you, and it's not really even that much harder than what you're already doing. You already deal with irate people. You already deal with, with things that can explode. You're going to be fine. The other thing is that this can be really fun. As I said with my students, teaching people to break things is a different skill and one that a lot of people are surprised how much they enjoy because the pressure is very different, the, the interests are very different, and people have a lot of fun doing it. So it's always nice, and it may be nice to, to even work into your regular hackathons as, you know, I'm tired of trying to write this darn feature, I'm going to go break stuff. It, 
can be fun for people. I'd also like to leave you with a bit of a question. I don't know, are, is anyone familiar with, with Steve Krug's work? So Steve Krug is one of uh, many usability people who's really pushed that usability doesn't have to be a giant impossible task. You can make some headway with, by buying someone a beer and asking them a few questions and getting to work on it. This is not to denigrate people who do the really hardcore, meaningful security and usability work. That, that's an entirely different discipline, but those people are few, we are many. We can, we can get things into a better state so that when we can afford to get an expert or when we finally you know, attract the interest of one, they won't be t solving stuff that's, that's e easy for them. So I would like for people to believe that security is a somewhat similar thing. It's harder with security because if you want to claim that something's secure, you have to get everything right. And you're a beginner, you're not gonna feel confident that you got everything right, even if it's possible that you did. And you maybe shouldn't feel confident that you've got everything right. Maybe it's good to constantly feel a little bit afraid. But I do want people to think of security as something that you can make a little bit of headway on and that there's a lot of low-hanging fruit in. So, <coughs> If you haven't read Steve's book, I, I, I highly recommend it. It's very, it's very thin, very short, and, and really compelling. But uh, I would like people to think about security as something that you can actually do. And so yeah, that's it. We should be breaking things together. <laughs>